said about you that if consciousness were a football game, you, Dave Chalmers, would forfeit right after the opening kickoff. Now, maybe he should have said rugby, but you get the point. I was about Jim to said say that? that? I was about to say that right now, as a matter of fact. <laughs> no, I think, think the point is that there, there's a standard saying in, in the sciences that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Mm -hmm. And so when you want to say, uh, uh, as David does, that you, want, you have to create this new category of, of, of reality, which we'll call, which is related to consciousness, or if you want to say there's this other kind of dimension or this other part to our world, uh, the first thing I want to know was, well, okay, why am I forced to make that assumption? You know, and unless I see data that says, yes, there's no way you can do this, uh, explain all the things we've been talking about here just on the basis of a physical mind, uh, until I see the proof that I can't do that, then I'm not going to go and take that next step. Well, I think the answer yeah. is that it's very clear you can't even explain physics without going beyond the material. Well, we'll if we talk about that. quantum mechanics, we have to, you know, we have to talk about a quantum wave function, something which is clearly not material, not substantive, and yet necessarily it has to, uh, it has to exist in order to explain the simplest physical phenomena. But, but at this point, isn't there a rather simple verbal shift that will get us at least to the point where we can address the same question, and that is the traditional categories of the mental and the physical, as they're used in popular speech and much of the sciences, are essentially 17th century categories, yes. and they're really out of date. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're interested in is how does the world work? Now, one of the uh, things I think we know about the world is that consciousness exists. It's a real phenomenon in the real world, and it's a biological phenomenon caused by processes in the brain. Now, maybe you can cause it in some other uh, uh, kinds of systems. We don't know that yet, but certainly it's caused in the brain of us. And I was amazed that you were seen to be denying it of uh, animals, Jim. I mean, uh, there isn't any doubt my dog Ludwig is conscious. I mean, oh, uh, so, is, so is my dog. Uh, yeah, but, 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 but you're you going to compare <laughs> dogs here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but the, the point I, uh, I was making at that, at that stage was that my own particular, everybody has their own idea of how the brain is going to, how the, this is going to turn out and how the brain will produce consciousness. Mine comes from the theory of complexity, things called emergent properties. Um, I think consciousness actually is an emergent property of having lots of neurons stuck together, and, and dogs have fewer neurons than we do. And this, we get into, this is very much like the, what you said, John, that this is a 16th century concept. We have one word, consciousness, and it's got to describe everything, every single, every possible collection of neurons. And it, we're just not equipped verbally to attack this problem. Well, do you yet. think there's a significant difference between human consciousness and whatever there exists of uh, similar nature in, in uh, non-human animals? Yeah, I think so. I, I think at least you can make that argument. And I, I think that uh, what I would, I would say was that uh, uh, someplace along the line, the evolutionary track, you get to a certain complexity, and suddenly the properties of the system become different. And that's happened many times on the way to human beings or to mammals or to sea cucumbers. Right? Yeah, no, look, no, there are no, all no kinds of differences yeah. between human and animal yeah. consciousness, but the essential thing is the thing that Dave was pointing to and that I was mentioning, namely, mm -hmm. they both have subjectivity. They both have these Absolutely. qualitative experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to explain, is yes. how do these qualitative experiences fit into the rest of the universe? Mm -hmm. And I'm suggesting that the traditional categories are not the way to pose the question. Yeah, I think there's no question yeah. there's, there's a really deep connection between the brain and consciousness. You duplicate my brain, in reality, you're going to duplicate my consciousness. You affect my brain, you well, give me some alcohol, no, wait, you're, 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 going, you're going to affect my consciousness. But the real question is, what is, it the story, what is the story about the brain explaining about consciousness? Mm -hmm. You tell a story about how the neurons interact in my brain, mm -hmm. my visual cortex produces motor responses and so on. This will explain how I behave. Yeah. This will explain how I talk to you and how I react and so on. And physical processes are really good for explaining physical structure and physical behavior. But once we get to consciousness, it seems we're dealing with a problem. It's no longer a problem about structure and about behavior of physical objects. It's about their sort of internal qualitative feel. And this is where it seems that the standard methods of physical explanation may well need to be, uh, to be explained. Dave, do you, believe in, do you believe in levels of consciousness? Uh, is a mouse conscious, a fly, a virus, a piece of wood? I think there are degrees of consciousness and there are very different kinds of consciousness. We as humans have particularly complex consciousness articulated by our concepts and our language, and we're conscious of ourselves. Now, take, uh, take a dog. A dog may well be conscious of the world around it, of its food, of hunger, of you know, fire hydrants and other dogs. may not be kind of conscious of itself in the same complex way. You go down to a fly. A fly is still kind of looking out at the world, and it may have some really simple kind of visual perceptual field. I don't see a reason to deny a simple kind of consciousness to a fly. And the further you go down, 
the degree of consciousness diminishes, the complexity diminishes, but it's very much an open question, I think, Fred, where it gives out. How, how do you approach that? I'm not sure if the degree of consciousness ever diminishes. I'm not even sure, I mean, that, that we are so super conscious ourselves. If I look at an anthill and I look at the activity of, of ants, I'm amazed at how human-like these simple creatures behave. So it's not to me, the, the, the real question is trying to define what we mean by consciousness. I think this is really a crucial point that scientists need to think about. How do we define it? What are the models we can use to really approach defining consciousness? I don't think materialism is going to work. I don't think pure subjectivity is going to work. But something that somehow encompasses the two has to be thought about. Well, I, Quantum I, mechanics I, might be a, a place to look for starting, but it's not going to be the final answer. I don't see the problem. You see, uh, the definitions in science come in two kinds. There's, the, there's the, uh, the technical definition that you give at the end of the investigation, and we're nowhere near being able to do that. But there's the common sense definition where you just identify the target of the investigation, and that's rather easy. Consciousness consists of these subjective qualitative states. You pinch yourself, and you will have an altered state of consciousness. You feel a pain that you didn't feel before. Now, that's what we're trying to explain. Now, eventually, of course, if we had a perfect science of the brain, then we'd be able to give a scientific definition of consciousness. It's like moving from the definition of water as a colorless, tasteless liquid to water as H2O. We're still in the colorless, tasteless liquid phase. But, but that's that, no problem. Well, will that complete definition obviate the need for consciousness as, a, as an entity, as some independent category? No, not for me. I don't know about independent. Uh, but, but the point is, we want to be able to recognize that consciousness is a real feature of the real world. It's a biological phenomenon. It's real in the same sense as digestion or photosynthesis. Real biological phenomenon. We're not going to get rid of it or show that it didn't really exist or was all an illusion. I want to jump in here for just a second and build on some of the ideas because it is consciousness is a, a construct as much as it is uh, a process and as we begin to try and do science on something like consciousness I think we need to recognize that um, Dave offered this kind of dichotomy between the first person and the third person perspective in consciousness the notion that we have our subjectivity that inner experience we have that objective dimension that we can study using electrodes and uh, PET scans and different kinds of physiological monitoring techniques but there's also the second person perspective that's the relational aspect of consciousness. And our concepts, our symbols, our, the meaning systems by which we can have this conversation are based on a shared set of cultural assumptions. And so I would suggest that there are data out there that suggests that consciousness is more than just the brain, uh, or at least that the brain's capacities are more than what we've reduced them to, but that because our worldview, our Western scientific worldview, limits our assumptions, we would interpret those data with a particular set of filters, which may limit our ability to actually get closer to the truth about what is the nature of reality. Well, of course, now you're introducing the interaction between two brains, which is, of course, going to be much more complex than the interaction within a single brain itself. But I so, would argue you can't have yeah. consciousness without mm -hmm. the multiplicity mm -hmm. of beings That's from all levels of well, the can, evolutionary well, yeah. strata. Well, but, maybe but it seems to me you can have subjective states of awareness if you're Robinson Crusoe on a desert island. Yeah. That is, the point that I take it Dave was making, and I was trying to make the same point, is that the mode of existence of consciousness is a first-person mode of existence. Now, of course, you can't have a fully uh, uh, developed consciousness of the kind we have. You can't have language unless you interact with other consciousnesses. Uh, and you can't explain consciousness without appealing to the third-person fact that we have objectively existing brains in our skulls. But the actual existence of conscious states, the actual feeling of a pain or the taste of the beer, those have a first-person mode of But are you equating that to uh, gastric secretions in the stomach, both being the process of biological yes, activity? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That is, the point I'm making is maybe we can create consciousness artificially in some machine, but as far as we know to date, it only exists in human brains and in certain animal brains. And it's probably not worthwhile worrying about how far down it goes because we don't know how it works in our brain. So it's not, we're not ready to worry about but flies. Do, do, do you agree on the uh, bile secretion uh, analogy? The difference with stomachs, I guess, is you can tell a physical story about the stomach and it'll make it transparently clear just why it is there are these gastric secretions there. Mm -hmm. You tell that physical story about the brain, how the neurons are hooked up to each other, all the areas are hooked up to each other, and you can say that produces consciousness, and probably it does. But does that explain why it produces consciousness? No, it seems to be kind of a further fact. It's an irreducible further fact that seems to be sort of tacked onto the story there somewhere. Doesn't what we need depend? in the science of consciousness is a theory of that connection mm -hmm. between the brain 
brain processes and consciousness. John, t tell me about some of the people who would completely deny the existence of consciousness. What's their best argument? And I want you to be honest. No, no, I, 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 I have uh, dealt with these guys for years, so I don't have any problem telling you their arguments. Their argument goes as follows. I'm going to listen carefully. Okay, here we go. As far as we know how 